I'll bring us some more chairs. You want to try For those who don't know, it was started in New York six years ago. Uh, it's a non-profit organization um, funded by uh, the kindness of uh, sponsors as well as the Department of Foreign Affairs in, in, in America. And we decided that uh, we should launch something like this in London. There was uh, one event last year that, uh, that was a great success, and we decided that uh, it's something that we should do uh, more regularly on different uh, industries. Um, because in New York, it became uh, a great focal point for various industries to uh, shine a light on uh, great Irish success stories and innovation, both startups as well as in corporates, and became a great place for uh, people, uh, startups, uh, corporates, or just people interested in a topic to uh, learn more about that, as well as a uh, venue for Irish networking. So, um, uh, delighted to have you all here tonight on our first event uh, of uh, the Statue of Digital Irish in London uh, on Sports Tech. Um, so, the panel here we have this evening, uh, um, on the far side here we have uh, Des Roy who's with Arsenal Football Club, and he's the uh, head of sports medicine and ex-head of uh, development for IRFU and my hometown comic, um, my home province. Um, we have Andrew Burke here as well, who is an uh, ex-Munster rugby player professionally, uh, and has had worked in a number of places, but currently now with Deloitte on uh, AI and uh, analytics uh, consulting, uh, focusing on sports uh, companies. Um, and then we have Amy Carey here, who's MD of Techstars, who uh, is also an angel investor for um, some sports tech companies amongst other industries. Uh, so hopefully amongst the three of them, we can have a good flavor of uh, uh, what's trending and where the opportunities are. Uh, my name is Jack Stenson. I'm an innovation consultant. I work for North Highland Consulting here in London. Uh, and I joined uh, Digital Irish about two years ago in New York. and was very keen to try and get it going here as well. Um, so to begin with, uh, Des, we talked to you first, kind of beginning with, um, uh, so beginning with, uh, thinking at the start of the game in, uh, in data and technology and sport. So uh, as head of development in the states, uh, I know they have the NFL have chips in the shoulder pads that are able to measure uh, the, and monitor the performance of players uh, in training um, as well as in the games and. And how is that used? How is that data used for in training as well as games? What, what insights does that draw in? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a lot of similar technology in um, the academy in Arsenal. So we have GPS, we have heart rate, we have 3D motion capture, we have four steps, four splits, uh, we have uh, groin virus, nord boards, um, paperless gyms, we have a huge amount of technology. But as I say to everyone, it's methodology before technology. It's important how we use it, and uh, we follow good principles. Methods are many, principles are few. Methods come and go, principles rarely do. So it's, it's, it's how you use them, which is really important. Um, an example from the dark old days in Connacht, um, I thought I was really innovative in 1999, and I bought a load of heart rate monitor watches and straps, and I put them on the players for training, and I was one of the first people to do it, and I wrapped up the watch. And I was hitting heart rate and training for most people, and I was analysing the training how many minutes above 80%. And then one training, I saw one player's hand go like that, just your training, something like that. And I didn't know, really notice, so the physio said to me, is he okay? <laughs> think so. What's going on? And then I looked around and all the players were doing that. And the players suddenly figured out if you do this with the watch, you get a higher score. <laughs> and Dennis didn't realize this for a week or two and he thought training was going great. And training wasn't going great. So um, the information is brilliant. Uh, the technology is fantastic. We can see um, how fast the player is going. Um, it's important that certain players get, well, all players get over a certain amount of high speed running the training during the week that helps them with durability to prevent injuries. And if a player doesn't get that, we can top up after training. It's fantastic information. It's it's so useful. Um, but it's how you explain it is very important too to the coach. How you explain it to the player, how you explain it to the parents, and how you interpret it. 
um, is key to the success of it and stick with the principles and alignment that, that everyone follows those principles. Sorry, I can walk around. <laughs> so yeah, I know what you mean about a methodology is crucial. Like New Zealand, for example, look at the way they teach young kids rugby and they, they group them. They don't group them by age, they group them by weight because you may get a slow developer who uh, may be stronger in the long run but is just uh, developed slower than other boys or girls uh, their age. Uh, and it depends on the methodology that you use. I'm going to pause you there. A lot of people use that example. <laughs> and there was a, a, par a party bus from Irish rugby that went to New Zealand to look at that. We were interested. And it was actually a complete failure. Um, <laughs> so what happened was there was a large amount of players in a certain weight category and a small amount of players in another weight category. And then what would happen because of the, the Polynesians, the Marys, and there would be a lot of 14 year olds in the same dressing room as 18 year olds. They were the same weight. It's a 14 year old listening to what 18 year olds are saying. That shouldn't happen. It's not good. Um, and, and there was a whole lot of psychosocial issues with it. So it was, a, it was an attempt. It's good. It was trying to, to facilitate that, but there's actually a better way of doing it called biobanding and assessing the maturation of the player. So we've got a 14 year old squad. Um, they're very different. They're all at different stages of maturation. We need to manage them in, um, individually. So some of them could be 98% to level height, and others are only 86% to level height. And that young player should be treated like a 13, 12 year old, whereas the player at 96% should be treated like a 15, 16 year old. And we can match them like that. But, sorry, that's technology again that can assess that, that can give a better program, that can individualise if we use the information smartly. So fair play to the Kiwis for coming up with that initiative, it failed miserably. Um, <laughs> and there's better ways of doing it now. And that's the principle of continuous improvement. We should always be looking to improve in those ways. Sure. Um, and then kind of on that subject of maybe using the, the wrong approach driving the wrong decision making, you published research on uh, how different uh, risk scoring models uh, have uh, shouldn't be used to um, Profile the likeliness of a player being injured on the field. Was there kind of were, 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 were models kind of being used the wrong way? I, I did. At least two of us read that research. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not even So you So yeah, that's the, the key message in that is oversimplification. There is this screen, and there would have been suggestions that if you get below 14, oh, you have much more chance of getting injured. But many, many people didn't get injured. And that's the problem with just using one bit of information, one bit of technology. And the people who are finding success are people who combine lots of different bits of information from lots of different technology, science and art, to make an informed decision, not drive the decision, not make the decision, but inform the person or people that have to make the decision. So the key message in that is there's no silver bullet. There's no one way of finding an answer in complex, dynamic systems um, where you have to work together and, and combine a lot of information. And that's where technology is and data science is helping us and making things that are very complex simpler. Right. Um, and then on that point as well, we like in the last year the Premiership has started allowing mobile devices on the sidelines. Um, and you know with uh, you have SAP and Man City for example boasting about the, the insights they can get on uh, tactics and characteristics on the opposing team and how that can uh, help uh, coaches on the sidelines change their own team's tactics. But what, what, how are you seeing any, do, do you, how do you think that's going to play out and will, will that uh, change the role of a coach if we, we have that data? Or is the data rich enough for SAP kind of lagging a little bit of what they can actually provide? Well, I, I don't work with the first team, so I won't be privy to that information. But we do have GPS on the sideline. We do have our own stats company in Arsenal, StatDNA, who retrospectively look at the, the technical, tactical information from games. And it will help. It's, 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 it's very good information, but it's down to the professional again who can interpret that, who can simplify it for uh, players, uh, who can simplify it for coaches, um, and help their training session, inform the training session. And sometimes it's happened in many uh, sports that the data appears, we store those information, we get lots of monitoring information, and it's not used. And I was at a talk by James Heskell. And he said this in the paper, so I'm allowed to use it. Um, <laughs> they got lots of good information from uh, monitoring. How are you feeling? Five, uh, one, I feel brilliant. Five, oh, I'm pretty much dead. And he filled out five, and no one did anything. And then another day, he filled out five, and the coach came to him and said, 
well, come on, if it was a World Cup final, you train. And he's going, yeah, but it's not a World Cup final. And I'm pretty sore, so I shouldn't be training. So if people don't act on their phone, it's, it's useless. And it's down to the coaches to embrace that information technology and uh, it'll be successful. Some will, some won't. So whoever embraces it and simplify it. Okay. Um, Andrew, I think you were, uh, if we touch on your experience as a, a player following on from that first four years of your professional career, um, I mean, if w w when you're on the field, uh, you know, you have a split second to kind of decide what you want to do um, uh, and, and then make that play, um, would you, I'm not sure how much technology was in, was in place during your time in Munster, but um, what, how well received do you think the average player would be on? Uh, data and insights because obviously it can be very limited in terms of what, it, what can be provided and uh, the factors that data can, can consider uh, to try and influence player decisions. Do you think it's it's advanced enough? I think I was probably beneficiary early on of Des's work in that kind of passage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, definitely not where it is now when I was playing uh, quite a while back. Um, but I think the main thing was just Ultimately, is there a clear feedback loop, like what Des was saying? So it was not as advanced as we are now, but we definitely would be at the earlier stages where probably very Excel-based in its approach, rather than some of the good Irish software companies that are out there now. And um, so I think early stages for it to be actually doing the decisions of players at that stage, just very much like kind of conversations and the, the art of it more than the science at that point in time. Right, okay. And then kind of moving on to where you are these days, which is working with uh, big sports companies. Um, so what are, what, what are the, the latest trends you're seeing in uh, technology decisions? Um, and and, and in, what are you seeing in AI and analytics uh, at these companies, whether they're media or clubs themselves? Yeah. Or, um, or other? So I think, like, generally the, the other side of the pro side is the media, like the entertainment side of it, like whether it's franchises or the media companies themselves. So data being a kind of core asset for them. If we take the club environment, how are they leveraging that data to kind of increase their sponsorship revenue? So that's kind of the kind of key things. And then ultimately, like any subscription business, increasing the memberships, how are they getting more personalized approaches to, to the fans? So the fans ultimately the consumer like any other businesses and what's kind of landing in to the work we're doing is in the same way that somebody churning off of a, a Netflix account, they're similarly churning off of a, a subscription for the club. So the other kind of pieces for them is saying, okay, how can we get more granular data and from a capture site and then also use it in a better way? And whether that be, you know, AI kind of gets thrown out there, but if it's one automating some of the processes to increase the distribution so you get greater viewership or greater engagement and then more personalized kind of experiences for it to be how you arrive in the stadium and a physical experience versus so some the NBA mentioned the other day is that their total fan base, maybe one percent will ever get to game. So how they really view their fans and that whole digital fan is kind of core trend that they're all looking at right now. So yeah, that's kind of key one. And just one other thing to build on the initial <coughs> question you asked Des is if we take that example of the, the GPS technology or the RFID from Zebra that's used in the NFL. A core thing there is AWS are the actual insights piece on top of that. You have that AWS next gen stats for the NFL and surprise, surprise, Amazon are then one of the main streaming partners. So one of the key things is like, how can we use this data, which one benefits the pro side, but also then is used to kind of increase the, the experience for the fan digitally, which helps from a marketing perspective. So it's kind of connecting the dots on those sides. Right. And where are you seeing across the big companies the really exciting innovation uh, projects, if not if, if not ready ready to market products, but the, the efforts? So like Alexa, for example, is there anything Amazon are doing there, or where are you seeing the exciting things coming down the line? Yeah, um, previous company I worked in, Sans, um, you know, based in Ireland as well. Um, you know, one of the key key things there is you know being able to ask the likes of Alexa or a series in those companies, you know, the stats from the game. Um, from a Deloitte site, there's, there's some really interesting startups that we keep an eye on. Probably a big trend would be computer vision and automating clipping of highlights is like something that a lot of companies are doing now. But rather than just that and then kind of predicting that content based on the demographic data or all of that type of information and, and pushing it out there, 
is a kind of move from on demand to on command. That's kind of a very much trend if we can suddenly ask our film, you know, show me the highlights of Spurs last night. And um, it, then, it then populates in front of us rather than suddenly getting pushed to content. I'm a Spurs fan, so I'm still feeling it. <laughs> um, and in that way, I think the kind of key underlying piece there is it's user generated data as well for those companies rather than it being, um, you know, collection of the kind of standard stuff they get by digitally engaging. So there's two angles to it. One is being able to kind of personalize and having an actual infrastructure underneath that to allow it to happen. <laughs> And two, then benefit of the data you collect off of that. So it's kind of probably on the trendy side. Um, and some of the, uh, I'm talking to someone who uh, used to work with Hawkeye, um, explaining that uh, they would have to take away and take the data away. It would take them a few hours to actually process it properly. So are we seeing kind of uh, any advancements there in collecting the data? Is there going to be more real time uh, AR, VR stuff coming down the line, maybe? or? Um, more interactive stuff for, for, for fans? Yeah, I think going back to that point of computer vision, like a lot of how data is collected, certainly for the on field work at the moment, is still video technology captures it, it's manually collected, um, and then that has a turnaround time. Multiple people solving that problem. So there are some innovative companies doing that, whereby like body pose analysis, and you, like, you might have seen Yapo kind of keen up there recently. And, that idea of body pose and uh, is coming to the mainstream very much, and especially with like mobile technology, that being on our iPhones now. So there's companies out there at Reduction that were doing that off of one broadcast video footage as well, so that they can collect tracking data, because that's personal data that's been collected off the ground, so that it's kind of contentious about that going into going into the media mainstream, but who owns that data versus collecting it directly off the broadcast. So I think with the Canadian firm Sport Logic, who are doing that really well. And um, they're working on a lot of ice hockey. They're kind of really even came on that side of things from a pure uh, automated capture technology. Okay. Um, and I wasn't sure if this would be a question for Jens or you, so we could, could talk to either of you. Um, if, if, if you think of uh, the way uh, entertainment um, industries are trying to trend towards, it's trying to be more engaging and more uh, immersive. Um, obviously, FIFA is a huge football. Um, industry almost in terms of computer games. Um, graphics becoming more aggressive, realistic all the time. But when we're collecting data on players, is there, is, is there a chance in the future where you might see that data end up in the models uh, of play, uh, in, in the game or then there are risks that betting companies could get access to that and all of a sudden we'd have this black mirror world. Uh, is that, am I going crazy down the line of what's possible here? Or? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that kind of having moved away from the performance side, that's you know esports, gaming, everything like that is a huge growth area. Like when people look at esports, one of the things is it's like digitally native sport. It's very accessible, very shareable, very social in general. You can interact with the players. It's got that immersive effect. So you know if we look at the profiles of people coming into both the club environment, I think and who's being hired in those top roles. It's interesting to look at those profiles. Um, uh, the current Liverpool CEO was previously EA Sports CEO. So if that kind of tells you that type of trend in terms of where the focus is. Um, in terms of how that's influencing FIFA, I'm not specifically sure, but um, I think you know they're obviously modeling off of that. And interestingly, then like how are brands getting into the esports game and everything like that as well. And, if it's kind of the FIFA side of things, are they different sponsorship deals for that versus the actual on-field ones as well? So I think the asset sits with the clubs and the players, and then you know there's great ways to kind of monetize that at the moment. So it's kind of project mm-hmm. esports side. Yeah, there's a famous. I don't know if anyone here played Championship Manager back in the day or any of those kind of football manager games. Yeah. So there's a famous story. I can't. And I, I don't know who the manager was, but he was managing Rangers at the time, and his kid was playing Championship Manager. And Leo Messi was 14 years old, and his son came to him and said, based on what I'm seeing, this kid is fucking amazing. Like, <laughs> you should sign him. And his dad was like, oh, go, you know, go ahead and get some exercise. Stop. <laughs> and playing computer games. And, uh, and obviously, Leo Messi did not go to Rangers. Uh, <laughs> thank God. Um, but you know, th- th- these guys, like uh, Codemasters back in the 90s, were collecting that data. Like they had you know, people scouting um, underage games for, for years. I mean, people probably saw the 
the video that Canon and others are producing at the Rugby World Cup now, where it, you know, to all intents and purposes, it looks like a video, but it's been automatically rendered from footage that they're taking from multiple different cameras. Like, absolutely, EA and all of these people are, are looking at this, and the question of who owns data is a, um, is a very interesting one. Good question. Um, I've got time to think about it. <laughs> so, I see the good and the bad. Uh, first of all, the professional living is going, the player's fitness results, that's the same as, as medical information. Yes. It's private, confidential, it's no one's business. Even within the club, if a coach or a, a scout wants to look at fitness results, we, we do it and interpret it. Because it takes interpretation to make sure it's not misinterpreted. Um, and then that kind of scares me if it goes out into the mass public. But if it went out in the mass public for a good reason, to get kids active, not playing video games, um, there's a, a, a GPS or version of it for uh, uh, children and, and youths, and they could try a, a, a gross figure, a simple figure of their star that they have to try and reach. I think that's brilliant. But a video game, um, I'm not inspired by it. And I'm, I'm, I'm worried if I look at American sports, yeah, it's very hard to get data off players. Um, because of the Players Association that hasn't hit Europe yet, it may in the future. Um, hopefully with the players educated enough that it's a good thing that we monitor them and we measure what they do for their own development. Um, and yeah, it's 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 tricky. Um, that one. I don't know where it's gonna go. Um, and and I'm a bit of a purist that it's the players' personal information. It's private, it's similar to medical notes, but I'd love to see kids uh, act. Sure. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, Eamon, uh, kind of onto the, the innovation side of things. So, um, I mean, uh, months ago I met the um, CEO of the Atlanta Pelicans who was talking about this new stadium that they built, in the, the Mercedes Dome uh, stadium. It's a lady over there, uh, Sarah, who I work with, who was actually uh, with me at that period of time. Um, but um, it was showing the innovation that's possible if kind of everyone works together. And so, uh, like in the uh, start time, I suppose, in the fan experiences uh, maybe in stadiums. What, what, what are you seeing as kind of the hot trends in startups? Yeah, I mean, there was a video that was doing the rounds the, the last couple of weeks of, um, I think it maybe it was at the Falcon Stadium or someone else, but it was, you know, the ability to stand in front of a billboard and have the players come around you and get that kind of photograph that you can then share to all of them. You know, I think people are starting to focus really specifically on, oh, I mean, they have been for a long time on, on fan experience. We invested in a, a company called Paranoid Fan uh, a couple of years ago when I was running tech startups in New York who were doing um, effectively social mapping for live events, right? So you can see where's the shortest queue for the bathroom at the stadium, you know, where's the cheapest beer, where is there a fan experience going on, where is there a, a you know, signing meet and greet. If you're in a city, it tells you about a Liverpool fan, um, it's told me what bars to go to if I want to watch Liverpool matches in New York, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and they're working with a bunch of the NFL teams, a bunch of the uh, NCAA teams and, and others. So I think you're starting to see I mean, the clubs have been alive to it for, for a very long time, but I think they're now starting to understand that that point of only 1% of people only ever getting to see an NBA game, there are tens or hundreds of millions of people who still want to interact or engage with that brand, as it were. And so thinking about you know everything from the social channels that they engage on to the experiences that they build to the you know augmented reality stuff that we're seeing people do or VR stuff that we're seeing people do, you know, there's a whole bunch of that that's, that's starting to come through now. Okay. And on the uh, VR stuff, so uh, years ago I remember seeing a picture of Dirty Aaron and Paul from John Bondra where they were viewing uh, some football match with 3G models and it was on the front cover of the Irish Times like, this is the future, you know, <laughs> which is all fellows with planks against and glasses on the basis, uh, which was gas. Um, but, and then 3G kind of went the way of, well, 3G kind of, kind of fizzled out. Do you see any, um, you know, hot startups are coming through with AR, VR type stuff to really kind of democratize the experience for, because the 99% can't get to the game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly starting to get a lot better. Um, you know, I think we're probably, I mean, we saw the Facebook keynote uh, comparatively recently where they talked about Oculus. You know, we're now at a stage where most of the experiences that you can have in the Oculus Rift, which is like the 800 quid version of their headset, or the pretty expensive version of it, you're going to be able to have on the Oculus Quest, which is the standalone headset that you don't need to have a, you know, super high powered computer to use. Um, by next year. And so we're starting to see more and more companies kind of putting money into those AR and VR experiences at a professional level, but also at a kind of, I suppose, almost like a prosumer level. So we've seen lots of companies that are looking at, some of you may have seen the, um, the guys, a company called Olivex, who were doing uh, work with the, 
a transportation system in Moscow where if you do a certain number of squats with the right form, uh, you, you travel for free. Uh, so there's companies that are using that kind of AR technology to help people, you know, even in a personal context, train better. Um, it's interesting on the VR side of things, we've seen a lot of companies starting to look at golf but at other areas um, where you can match your swing against what professional players do rather than improve and improve and iterate and iterate. And so there's a lot of really interesting stuff starting to come down the tracks. The, the challenge with VR is always trying to guess when is it going to have its Alexa Christmas? Like when, when is everyone going to get a $100 VR headset for, for Christmas? And it, it's, it's obviously it's not going to be this year. Um, and so part of my job is to try and invest in companies that are two or three years away from um, having their Christmas moment. Um, and, and I've invested in quite a few VR companies, so I'm hoping that next year, <laughs> um, eventually it, it, it happens. But I mean, for anyone who's tried the, the, the Quest um, in particular, like if you play the, the Apollo Creed boxing game, if you play the Star Wars game, it is like having a workout, right? Like you're flailing your arms around and, and moving around quite a lot. So there's a lot of really interesting use cases coming out of that, and I think even more to, uh, to come over time. Very cool. Um, and of course, a lot of our discussion this evening has been about, you know, uh, uh, technology used in sports or in fan experiences. But, um, we actually have some startups that are going to be talking uh, after Q and A in a few minutes. But um, a lot of them are more focused on the everyday person and them engaging with sports, as you're saying there. So thinking broadly across everything in sports tech, are there any kind of hot areas that you're seeing that um, uh, hyper growth and startups or some really exciting things appearing? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of things that are starting to happen, right? So I mean, I think as um, the phone on your or the camera on your phone gets better and better as the the cameras that you as your connect the the version of the connect that Microsoft brought out reasonably recently as they get better and better you can actually do an awful lot more in terms of depth sensing so we invested in a company called Vitru Health who are going through the tech search program at the moment and so um, what they're doing is assessing people for musculoskeletal conditions and so they can track a whole range of, of movements from kind of sit to stand to balance to a whole range of, of different areas to augment what, what physios are doing. Um, and that's not just for the elite level, although they are working with some Premier League clubs, but it's also for you know individual physios and for health assessments. Um, so we're starting to see more of that come through. We're starting to see a lot more people thinking about kind of applications for the watch and, and for general fitness. Like if you think about it, people who are into fitness either fall into the casually into it or like unbelievably obsessed with it uh, bucket. And the people who tend to be unbelievably obsessed with it spend a lot of money. Um, so there are quite a few companies kind of looking at, at, at improving um, that experience as well, I would say. And the other thing that we're starting to see people look at is, is that idea of snackable content. Um, and it's funny how you know, kind of ideas come around. I remember about 15 years ago being at a Mobile World Congress and meeting this Swedish company called Global Mouth. They had this technology that as you left a game, you would get a telephone call and it would be the coach being, you know, it was the coach going, oh, the lads don't go today, you know, whatever it is, the, the inter post-match interview that you never saw because if you were at a match, you're not watching it on TV, so you don't see the, the reaction. And so these guys were doing this and, uh, you know, you got the telephone call now, people are doing that as, you know, looking at it as being something that can be delivered directly into your AirPods. Right, something that could be directly delivered by Alexa. Um, we're seeing companies, there's a, a company with an Irish vendor called Afterwards McLabs that are doing uh, personalized audio creation. And so you say, I'm interested in Liverpool news about the iPhone and you know, A, B, and C others, uh, you know, this band and that band. Um, and you get a personalized 10 minute podcast read by anyone's voice in the world, by the way, it's a bit creepy. Um, <laughs> Uh, technology, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's a bunch of stuff happening in, in that area where it's everything from calling up highlights to actually getting kind of relevant information delivered to you whenever, whenever you want to. All right, cool. Um, and then uh, one last question for me before we open the floor for a bit of Q&A, some of your questions, um, is uh, if we do have some startups and scale-ups and some more advanced uh, companies in the room focusing on sports tech, but if you had a, if someone was looking to launch a sports tech company, uh, start a sports tech startup, uh, what advice would you give them or would you have any advice uh, on that? I mean, I think, uh, you know, talk to as many people as possible, right? I would say that nowadays the clubs um, and the leagues, we've got Michael from Major League Baseball here, Mike O. Shapiro for tonight. Uh, so I think the leagues and a lot of other people are, are starting to engage with startups and having those conversations, even at a very early stage, is something that's practical and doable and manageable and something that they're eager to invest in. I mean. You know, Arsenal ran a, an accelerator themselves not so long ago. You know, quite a few clubs uh, invest in companies 
there are lots and lots of different touch points within uh, professional teams where you can you know actually build some credibility and build some network and, and, and get some uh, POCs or pilots or, or letters of intent uh, on the table. I think the biggest mistake people make is they just never try. They're not never try, they never ask. Um, and so whether it's sending a really, if anyone wants to talk about funding, like please send me a really short email. Like I don't, I don't need eight paragraphs, like just who you are, what you're doing and, and, and why we should talk. And the more that you do that, the more that you will get replies. Like just don't be, honestly, don't be afraid, right? Because most people are actually quite nice. <laughs> most. <laughs> um, Mike is actually one person that, uh, from uh, Major League Baseball we were asking to speak to us, but he's on his holiday, so we decided not to push him to uh, sit up and through here. But also that brings me to a side point around, uh, the panel is obviously all male and pale. Um, we couldn't find an Irish lady involved in sports like it was available this evening, but we did try. Um, this is the only all-male panel that we've I've been doing a digital Irish event. Um, we apologize. Uh, we will try better in the future. Uh, but uh, on that note, opening out the floor, if there's anyone who has any questions, I'm going to, I'm going to share my microphone. Um, so we're going to be right now. Uh, as you mentioned that you, you strongly believe that a player's medical information is their own and the player in that right to have you seen much in terms of clubs using data on players such as top speeds and things like that to drive transfer values up and things like that? Um, or is it a negotiation point essentially? Drive transfers up. Um, I've seen it when we're looking at players and we're, we're seeing are they, are they good and speed is a good indicator. It's not to be on end all, it's a contributor. Um, I wouldn't be involved in negotiations, buying players and stuff, so <laughs> thankfully I just meet them, test them, give feedback on the player. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a good contributor to talent and uh, speed, so it, sure. it's a useful measure for sure. So I guess my question is, are clubs sharing that training data in these negotiations? Um, if you want to answer sales. <laughs> Thank you very hard. <laughs> 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 Help me out there. <laughs> I think, um, so coming from a vendor side previously, and then there is the ask of event data is something whereby everyone has that event data on players and then they're profiling valuations off of that, getting the physical data that's collected on the players and sharing that across is not generally on the market for sharing because of those reasons. and. GDPR only coming in, you know, overall in the grand scheme of things from a transfer perspective quite recently. So one of the use cases that that's brought about is being able to capture tracking data off of broadcast footage, but that's not actually going to give you the full picture either because you know yourself, the ad comes up and the, or the, sorry, the replay comes up, so you're missing a lot of information as well. It's obviously a desirable piece, but it's, uh, there's no, no gold solution right now. <laughs> uh, uh, we run a company called Airhead, which is creating a new pollution mask. And uh, from doing that, we've become aware that there's a lot of studies uh, about pollution and the effect it has on your, your health. Um, no, no. Okay. Uh, some of those effects are, it's linked to marathon times, it's linked to intelligence, it's linked to productivity at work. Have you seen anything come through in the sports environment in relation to, to air pollution and the impact that could have on players? Not that, I, I mean, we see a lot of applications for, for textiles programs. Not yet, I would say. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Was that the answer you were hoping for? <laughs> Write him a short email. <laughs> Two lines. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, sorry, uh, again, linking it to decision making, I guess what this will be for Andrew. Um, I saw recently that Pro Football Focus are uh, working with AWS in terms of trying to combine kind of analytics and uh, presumably some stats with that as well in terms of establishing contract values for players and things like that. Have you seen that much in other sports? And do you see that developing rapidly? Or? 
Um, well, I think like US sports is obviously a very open topic in terms of player salaries and therefore like those contract negotiations um, versus football. It's kind of dependent because like demand and supply side. So the club who's buying is going to impact. If you've got Man City landing on your door wanting that player, you might decide on a different negotiation versus somebody else. So I think you can draw your data into it for the negotiations piece, but there's a lot of more nuance around that. So I think it's a kind of risk mitigation strategy having that analytics, but it's not necessarily the be all point that decision. Thank you. I think you know there's a lot of talk about data and machine learning and AI and, and all of these things. It always makes me think of a, a quote from um, from Brian O'Driscoll, which is. Um, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Uh, and I think there is a big difference between having a wall of data, which you know everyone has and, and is accessible nowadays um, to clubs, to players, to, to fans, to all sorts of different people, um, and then having the lens through which you observe that data, right? The best uh, machine learning and AI companies that we've invested in are not ones that replace people, they're ones that augment people, they're ones that make the process and, and, uh, and their job better, like Fit True Health, who I mentioned earlier, their job is not to replace physios, it never will be, it's to allow physios to have more patient contact time. If you look at the um, stats around uh, computer vision and radiology, to go slightly off topic, is uh, one of the hottest areas at the moment, right? Human radiologists have roughly a 91 or 92% error rate. Uh, computer radiologists have about a 91, 90, or, sorry, <laughs> 91 or 92% accuracy rate. Obviously, please go to the doctor. <laughs> computers have about a 91 or 92% accuracy rate, but when you have humans plus computers together, that accuracy rate goes up to about 98%. Right? So I think having that kind of layer of data plus then a lens through which you look at it is, is the most important thing, because I think if we made purely data-driven decisions, then um, the world would be a less colorful place. Just to build on that, and that's really kind of one key point is the question earlier about what, what to go after. I can't, the one thing is people trying to do everything and they're going to bend diagrams that come up in presentations about betting, media, performance, and everything else that sits under the hood and trying to solve all of those problems. So if we take that computer vision example, there's an Israeli company called WSC Sports who works with quite a lot of rights holders on simply the use case of automating like that production of highlight clips that I mentioned workflow hugely increasing the distribution capability and therefore as a result of that the, the engagement rates. So a very, very clear use case in the workflow which is assisting people in the digital team, not getting rid of jobs, but it's not trying to boil the ocean in terms of the company and, and seeing those companies that are doing extremely well versus um, somebody's trying to kind of do everything that falls between stools essentially. Just a few thoughts from um I would get literally five to ten emails a week with product and technology and a few suggestions in terms of, of me deciphering that and, and dealing with people is well don't over promise to start with and the one thing that people like myself look for straight away is is there some evidence behind it is there some research is it peer reviewed is it valid and reliable and you'd be surprised how much times it's not um, and then we have a grading system within Arsenal with Alan McCall, our research and development person, and it's A to E. And A would be like a peer reviewed research, it would be uh, practitioner backed, it would be living example, it would be expert approved, and then down at E is the person says it works. <laughs> so the person saying it works doesn't mean it works. And we give an in house check. Um, but if someone graded E wouldn't really get to the next stage. Um, and then all this building um, funds, potential for uh, listening to feedback and improving the product. And listen, some people who are going with products are so enthusiastic and talk, 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 and don't listen to the person that's asking the questions and talking to them. So there are just some experiences from dealing with companies um, over the past. Okay. One last question. Oh, one last question. Um, every every tech vertical will say that capital is prime, and entrepreneurs can't act as enough capital to grow their business, grow their product. I suppose that in sport, 
that power of sport. We've got athletes worldwide and the levels of salary differ, US being quite a lot higher than maybe outside of the Premier League in England or in the UK. But it, what can we do as a sport tech ecosystem as such to maybe bring in more athletes investing in products that a they feel passionate about or that are trying trying to solve side challenges or yeah how can we basically increase capital and funds coming in so entrepreneurs got more runway to, to do great things for you. I mean I think there's there's quite a few athletes in, in the US that have their own DC content yeah. very very active uh, angels. There are actually a surprising number here as well. They just maybe don't don't always kind of talk about it quite quite so much. I think part of it is um, obviously in this country there are fairly generous tax breaks for, for folks, not that you know, some sports people necessarily need them, um, but there are very generous tax breaks available for, for people who are making um, investments and that may be going through players associations, it may be going through probably actually going through agents, um, but I think it's, a, it's an awareness of, of what they can do and, and could do and potentially should do. It's an awareness of what types of products they can you know, effectively leverage their celebrity to, to promote. Um, but it's, it's happening an awful lot more often, actually. Um, I mean, everything from, you know, Lewis Hamilton's vegan uh, hamburger place that's, that's, that's opening up um, right the way through to kind of actually elite level athletes in, investing in SEIS rounds and, and getting more involved. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an education job, and it may just be kind of arranging events, having people pitch at, at you know, I suppose whatever kind of walking cubidor type of things that um, you know the athletes go to, but I think it's 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 making them aware of what's available and what's out there and how there is actually a, a benefit for them. And it may be the tax benefit. It may be um, you know that they can use their celebrity to drive engagement or drive revenue. And, and you know I think once people are cognizant of what the opportunities are, you know we, we see. I mean it's it's happened in the city. It's happened in insurance. It's happened in healthcare where people who are making good money in that industry start to kind of unlock their wallet over time as they see successful companies being built. So the more that we see successful sports tech companies coming out of this part of the world, the more that we will see some people starting to kind of open their wallet accordingly, hopefully. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thanks so much, guys. That was a brilliant discussion on uh, sports tech. I'm really insightful to hear from your various perspectives on developing players being a player and now on big, big consulting uh, big firms and then working with the startup. So a really wide uh, variety of opinions there on uh, sports tech. Um, so now that brings a, uh, first of all, thanks so much guys. <laughs> so now we have uh, our first startup. Um, Take our chairs, what is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've moved it, I think, is it Jay Stapleton? That's me, yeah, too. I'm going to leave this off. Uh, good evening, guys, how are you doing? Um, so, what's the problem? Uh, I'm going to start with two stories, uh, just to how explain how I um, saw the vision for the business opportunity of Buffett. So um, I met a friend one evening for uh, a beer and as soon as I met him he was not quite himself, quite stressed, overwhelmed, seemed quite distracted and I asked him what the problem was. And he said they actually came along to ask you for some sales and marketing tips. Um, I've just started a new job uh, as a PT and signed up to a gym and I have to pay them £1,200 a month fixed cost to have a space to find um, um, and train clients there. But the problem that we have is, is that there's not enough leads coming in through the gym, so I have to pursue a sales and a marketing role with no experience, no bud budget, and it's extremely stressful. So just freezing that story for one moment, I just thought that was yeah, quite a big problem. The next story I'm going to tell you is just about a phone call I got from a friend who was trying to lose weight for her wedding. And um, she was extremely kind of uh, stressed out. Everything she was trying wasn't working for her. And I asked her to talk me through her journey. And she basically said that she tried the gym, but she found it extremely intimidating. And she actually used the word that she hated it. 
She then told me that she used to go out for jogs by herself and uh, that was quite lonely and she needed to be motivated to get fit. Um, and thirdly, she tried group exercise outdoors, but the problem that she experienced over time was that she was going to one exercise class with the same people and the same trainer. So I thought to myself, well, these are two very, very big problems in a billion pound industry. So we have the solution to it. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dave Stapleton. I'm the founder of BooaFit, which is a technology business in the outdoor fitness space. What we do is we connect trainers to clients for group fitness classes <laughs> seamlessly. Our value proposition on the trainer side is we reduce the risk, cost, and time with building and scaling a fitness business. For this consumer, we're the easy to use um, book, pay, a book and payment solution for a variety of different outdoor fitness classes uh, with no contracts. And the opportunity is massive. The UK has been, the fitness industry has been growing, I think for like 16 years steadily at about three to 4% on average. And it's not about to stop. We're gonna see the market fourfold over the next five to six years. There's three pillars of our market in our business. And the first one is group training. Look at the scale. Group training was outside the top 10 fitness trends in 2016, and it's jumped to second spot last year. And the results are recently just out, and we're still holding that position. The question is why? Okay, it's all fueled. Group training is highly motivating, it's highly social. And the problem with the, my, my friend that she wasn't getting any, she wasn't witnessing any progress and she wasn't witnessing any results. What happens there is, is that the consumer gets demotivated and they fail. Outdoor, or sorry, group fitness is a remedy for that. And that's the reason why it scales so quickly because 85% of the global market needs to be motivated to get fit. And this is the best solution for it. Um, the next pillar of our market is apps, the technology side. So you can see apps are growing 87% faster than the overall market itself. So let's ask ourselves the question, so why is that as well? Sorry, can you guys hear me? <laughs> um, and the reason why is fitness is a daily, weekly, and a monthly activity for the consumer. And with that, the consumer needs to be educated, they need support, and they need some information to help themselves progress on their journey. Um, the third pillar of our market is outdoor fitness. And it's proven that it's actually a healthier way to be active than indoor fitness. Uh, it's the number one remedy for, out, for, for mental health when it's in a group environment. Um, it's better for your blood pressure, you actually burn more calories. So this is the, our key driver to why we're setting up BooaFit. All of the investment has been going into the indoor market and now it's time to invest into the outdoor market. Um, we sit here today, it's a bootstrap business. The business started in a WhatsApp group by me connecting supply and demand. Um, today, uh, we're supported by Google and we're now bringing the business to a different stage where we're doing our SEIS funding and we're scaling around London to go to the UK and we're going live on Cedars in the next, hopefully, 10 days. Um, also, uh, a member here in House of Sports, and we get support from Sports Tech Cup, who are connected to our host tonight here in London Sports. So, um, sorry if I haven't got the mic quite right here, but thanks for your time, and uh, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Any questions for Dave? Yeah, great question actually. Um, so I'm going to answer that question with a story. So I signed up to a number of outdoor fitness companies in my research phase and this was the question in my head whether this business would work based on that on the weather and I specifically signed up on the 2nd of November 2017 in Baltic. It was in Finsbury Park and it was a group fitness class outdoors. I nearly cancelled myself two or three times. I rocked up and there was 75 people in the class, okay? And the reason why people think that the weather is a problem is, is that if you love outdoor fitness, you're actually attracted to training in the different seasons. 
and an ongoing quote came back to me. It was actually this lady I partnered up with her, and I asked her the question. I was like, God, I'm pretty cold here. Like, uh, do you still, guys still come when it's snowing? Because this is my first time attending the class. She goes, Dave, the problem is never the weather. The problem is the clothes that you've chosen to wear. Cool, listen, uh, thanks very much for everybody. Welcome, anybody has any more questions, grab Dave. We'll have a networking afterwards as well, so come and ask loads of questions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's a podcast in the room, uh, whoever is interested will be going to afterwards. But um, next up, we have Martina McKnight from Clubforce. Over and back, easy enough. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, my name is Martina McKnight. I work for Club Force. Um, I am responsible for the North of Ireland, but also now the UK. Um, I'm the, the business development executive for for those areas. So we are Club Force. We're basically an online sports management system for sports clubs. We work with a range of organisations, government bodies. But primarily, our main base across the island of Ireland is is, is clubs. Um, we're the lead CRM system for sports clubs in the island of Ireland, um, and we work with over 1,500 clubs. And um, basically, we have uh, basically monopolised that market um, as it stands. So you can see that there's about 600,000 members that are registered um, on the system, and we speak with volunteers daily. Um, with over 4,000 volunteers, who actually inform us of what they need in terms of their system, and we go away and we fill up, we improve it, add new features on. So I probably kind of jumped apart there because you're probably thinking, well, what does it actually do? So as I said at the start, it's a sport, online sports system that is basically geared towards clubs, but it helps the parents, the members, coaches, volunteers, club officers, leagues, and national government bodies. So that whole area from um, the player, the parent, right through the government body can access and utilize the club force system. Primarily, it's all based on uh, membership registrations, but we've got a range of features for communications. We've launched a brand new app. Uh, coaches are able to use the app to communicate directly with the players or the parents of the players to eradicate the need for WhatsApp. Everything that we do is based around GDPR and the protections um, that come with that. Coaches don't want to see a hundred thumbs up when they get sent out a message. Who's going to train on Tuesday night? They've got all thumbs up. Sorry, my Johnny can't go. He's sick. Other people jump on board. They don't want to see all that. What they want to see is a detailed description of who's going, who's not going, and, and keeping it as simplified as, as possible. The parents, what do they get out of it? Seamless registration. You can register when you're at home. No more having to go out in a cold night and register with your local club. All your data and information is secure. You can change your preferences at any time. It's a secure payment um, processing system, uh, and then you can also go in and manage your documents. So any clubs, if you've got a trip, uh, you can upload your passport, your trace photograph, birth certificate. Again, you can manage um, all the information um, that is in there. For the club officers and the volunteers, like I mentioned, they dictate what happens on our system. They inform us of what's needed. And the reason being is volunteers are so vital in any organisation, but primarily at sports clubs. Um, by using the system like Clubforce, they could save up to about 75% of their time and be able to spend more time completing funding applications, getting more money for the club without having to worry about all the paperwork, all the admin and all the administration that comes with that, as well as protecting themselves because they know the data and information is all um, protected online. Leagues and, leagues and camps, um, that's just uh, obviously uh, being able to get teams to come on board and, and manage that. And then national government bodies, looking at your data, looking at the demographics, and we spoke about that tonight, being able to analyse and, and critique uh, the information and help plan and formulate uh, your development plans going forward. Um, so that's just some of the features um, as well. I don't know if you could see it, but again, it's all about the, the payment processing. But we can also look at um, retention reports. How are our memberships doing? Are we losing members? Are we retaining them, paying them? What can we do? We can send out uh, information and, and uh, emails, uh, feedback from all our members and our clients. Tickets and barcodes are a little, a little bit like Ticketmaster. So even your local club, say they have a kids disco on or they have a, a big game that week, they can put um, that online, people can register, and then you get a barcode or a QR code that could be scanned at the door. That's kind of things that club, local amateur clubs think only happens in the bigger leagues. And on club force system, we can actually get it right down to the, to the amateur level um, as well. Camps, events, anything at all that needs any kind of registration, it's 
we can put it online with data and financial information going there. And we're just about to release, which will be great for clubs, is the ability to actually invoice from the system. So just given that, you can see clearly it's got a holistic approach to help any sports club. It doesn't matter if it's rugby, football, hockey, swimming, any club can use the system um, and help them manage their members uh, and their mostly the volunteers, which is key. Let's just wait uh, a screenshot there. You can see some dashboards on the left hand side. That's what we call a secretary support. And there's a number of features in there. Um, and that's just to give you an idea that just looking at the glance, you can see how well is our club performing? Are we bringing in more money for our memberships? Um, you can also see the pie chart how many adults, juniors do we have, how many under 16s do we have? It's kind of cut off a wee bit there at the bottom, but male to female ratio, blue and pink, it's about to think, but it's there to show how many that we have registered. And there's other financial data in there. Uh, and the key to that as well is everything is transparent, it offers good governance, and things like this um, help clubs when they're going for funding applications with the government bodies because there is good governance um, within that as well. On the right hand side here, I've mentioned it before about the club app, um, but this will help manage your teams, manage communications, but also you can track payments. So anyone in green will obviously be paid, you are not going to chase them. Anyone in red needs to pay up. For a lot of clubs, you should not be on the pitch or the, or the pool side or, or maybe on court unless you've paid your membership fees for your insurance. What that enables clubs to do is for the coach to say, you shouldn't be on the pitch, you need to pay your fees. You go online while you're, while you're standing there, pay your fee, update that, it'll turn green, now you can go on and play. So it helps the, the coaches make sure that they're being covered um, and, and the admin officers as well. So, like I said, we have kind of monopolised the, the market um, in Ireland. I'm responsible for the north of Ireland and now the UK. We do have a number of clubs um, that are already currently using the system. Uh, that's a few there. There's a few that have missed Kensington Golf Club and a few others. Um, however, I'm here tonight uh, with the hope of making uh, good connections. Network is all after, so I'm going to see a big queue just waiting to talk to me. Uh, and anybody else that really wants to know a little bit more information, information about Club Force and what we can do. And any assistance would be appreciated in making, helping me make those connections. So, thank you. That's all, folks. Thanks so much. We are switching laptops for this one. Is David Dunn? Oh. From Hexes. My background is in performance nutrition, where I've worked with various NBA organizations, seven Olympic gold medalists, 15 world champions, and the last World Cup winning squad. I'm CEO of Hexus, and we are a health app where we're trying to deliver personalized nutrition driven by world-class coaches and their tools, putting them in your pocket. I want to start briefly with a story. Um, a very fortunate and unfortunate day at the same time. I was at Harlequins Rugby Club where I was doing some consultancy work when the phone rang at the front desk and it was the police asking for me. I was a bit unsure as to why they were phoning and anyone that needed me generally had my mobile. So after going to take the call, I quickly realized it wasn't such a bad idea. My housemate wasn't in that much trouble or what he did last weekend never got found out. <laughs> Fortunately, it was actually a participant that had taken part in a research project my team had done where we were looking to drive these nutrition behaviors. She was a member of the Surrey Police Force and when the research project had finished, she wanted us to carry on delivering the service more widely to the police force. Now, whereby police aren't traditional athletes, they're a good example of the organizations that what we can do, uh, what our service can cater for, and people who want what we have. And I thank Dave for this, because Dave illustrated this nicely for me too, that there is a decline in wearables, that they have under-delivered on their promise, and the apps that are out there currently provide quite rigid, generic, and static frameworks. Calorie counting that people dislike and ultimately discontinue as a result of coaches not being able to scale and they price themselves out of the market. But what we've done, and thanks again for Des for highlighting the need for peer-reviewed good science, we've taken some of the latest lessons in performance nutrition and we've distilled that knowledge into a easy to use framework that is, provides some first to market um, features. So Sam, a co-founder at the back of the room, his PhD and two postdocs were actually in a framework of how we can manipulate our food to optimize our response to training. And what we've done that is built that into an algorithm or product and linked it to the supermarkets so we can automate that part of our coaching process to deliver this world-class nutrition 
to that wider amateur athlete market, underpinned by all of the skills within our team. Here's a good example of you know, how confident I can be that it works in the real world. One of our players, Al Harlequin, is using his, his screensaver when we originally introduced this in 2016. The size of the market in the UK is quite large, which is fantastic. Again, Dave, thanks for the advertisement again of the growth of health apps, which is doing half the job for me, which is brilliant. Uh, but this is just the UK. You guys can imagine America and the size of the market in comparison there. Currently, we do feel we are cut above the rest for the reasons I've said. We do provide a scalable, adaptive framework with these unique first market features that we know these weekend warriors and amateur athletes want and need. Our main driver of our business model initially is B2B to provide us with financial stability before progressing to B2C where we see our scale. We have a number of sign-ups already uh, in advance of our product. We will be launching in January, so a number of white uh, sports organizations, and then in 18 months' time, we'll be delivering our doctor performance, but I'll leave that one for another day. To date, we've raised 125 of the 500K, and our investors do include athletes from the European Tour, a European Tour winner, a World Championship our champion cyclist, as well as a Premier League performance coach. <coughs> What began as PhDs, over 5,000 hours of elite coaching, 100 hours of focus groups and interviews, and extremely large quantitative data sets, is now a very robust team with expertise in human nutrition, behavioral science, human performance and exercise physiology, machine learning, AI, product technology, and finance. Thank you very much for your time. I'm David Dunn, and I'd love to take any questions you may have. One question, and then David, hopefully, around for a chat after will be Irish in line. Any questions? Hi, David. Um, you mentioned there about um, linking some of like the nutritional information to the supermarkets. Yes. Um, and you, like, can you just explain a little bit more about that and how you can kind of say tailor plans for athletes and? Yeah, absolutely. So. It's one of the questions I'm always hoping to get because it's the, within that science realm, so it, it's nice for us. So as I said, Sam, our co-founder at the back of the room, his PhD was looking at how we can manipulate people's food intake to amplify their response to training. And as Des said, we've sort of got some nice, solid, peer-reviewed, published uh, research at the highest level of what he classes as A-grade. So what we've done is we've looked at with, um, what people's training. So you simply input your training, so you, your plan for the week, and then we provide a unique color coding framework and traffic light system. And within that traffic light system, you'll see you have a, a red, amber, and green, which would be a code for low, medium, and high. You click on that, you see bespoke recipes tailored to your macronutrient requirements at a deeper level, and then you can just hit add to shopping list and buy. But I'd love to take that offline and show you a little bit more of what we have too. Yep. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Thanks very much. So, Last but not least, we have Des Ryan back to the stage, um, talking about St. Hampton College. So I think you're the clicker there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. So every day should be a school day, and this <laughs> certainly is the first time I've ever done a pitch. Uh, so I'm out of my comfort zone, but I like that. So uh, when I came to Arsenal eight years ago, uh, one of the things I requested is that I could keep my involvement in St. Hampton College, because I truly believe in it. I firmly believe in coaching, learning to coach, education. And the, the, the founder of Satanta College is one of my mentors. I'm, everyone should have a mentor. I have three brilliant mentors, but Lee Hennessy is one of them. And he saw something similar that I saw. I went to university, and I was very unhappy with what I learned. It did not prepare me for the professional sports world. I've, since I've come to England, I've interviewed about 160 people, and I'm only happy with about 20 of those people, that they're competent and competent enough to work in professional sport. So the standard of education needs to rise, uh, for sure. And I'm, I'm very happy with this uh, master's program. So to give you a little insight on what is needed to work in professional sport, let's have a look at Arsenal Academy. Let's have a look at one venue, Walthamstow, just down the road. You've got the under nines, under 16s. 160 players to look after properly. Then you've got London Colney. You've got the first team, you've got the women's team. And in the academy, you've got the under 18s, under 23s. 47 players to look after. Um, 
These are all the people in the department. Uh, the conditioners, 10 of them in blue, the physios in red, two doctors, two nutritionists, two psychs. Um, these people need to know how to work in the professional environment. Um, so, there they are. And what, me as a leader, I've got to make sure they have a clear vision, clear KPIs, clear mission, clear objectives, similar depth and breadth of knowledge, so we can deliver what we should do in the performance world. But education is a big part of that. CPD is a big part of that. So let's just have a look at the performance center um, here. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Full of technology, paperless gym, force plates, uh, 3D motion capture, virtual reality, all the things we spoke about, GPS on the pitch, heart rate monitors, uh, you name it. But people need to know how to use it. Methodology along with the technology. Um, those sessions goes on. Now there's nearly 200 players that we need to monitor properly, program properly, progress, regress appropriately with all that information. That just doesn't happen naturally. You've got to learn how to do that. You've got to be educated. Look at these under 14, spoke about them earlier. Some of them bigger, more mature, some of them less mature. They've got to be programmed differently. You've got to understand that. You've got to understand maturation. Um, GPS again. Player profiles, physical profiles, fitness results, comparing them up to the first team, comparing them with the, the same age group. This is very complex. People need to know about this. This is just one session in GPS. This is just the group average. This isn't looking at it individually. Is this taught in universities? I certainly wasn't taught it. I don't think it is taught well. Um, then what I did is I asked Liam to educate the physios conditioners together with the courses in Sapanta. Similar depth, breadth and depth of knowledge, similar language. Uh, raising the standard, and that certainly happened. So that's why I truly believe in this master's course. There's other courses, uh, certs, and degrees, etc. And the master's content is, is very good for technology, very good for the performance world. You got the project, you got um, uh, technology, you got human motion, human movement analysis. Understanding that equipment and all the relevant equipment that's out there these days, but as well as the science the art, so it can be interpreted, shared, translated, educated. Um, and it's online learning, blended learning. And a, and a short story, um, Johnny O'Connor, professional rugby player, thrown out of three schools, bit of a rag, um, <laughs> never went to university, but he linked in with Satanta during his playing days, near the end of his career. He did a strength and conditioning degree online while he was playing, understood the content, understood the technology, came as an intern to Arsenal, a very old intern, but learned the trade, applied the knowledge, and now he's one of the best conditioners I know working in college rugby. So a, a practical way of learning as well, both um, on-site and online. Uh, some very good tutors, coaches, academics, both that actually can give you the practical information for the real world. So finally, performance is about outcomes. So I have a test for you all. Have a look at this player. This is eight years ago. This is Hector Beller. He's quite good. He is running. Now we can use all the technology, motion capture, 3D, um, force plates to look at that. What's wrong with that? What does he need to work on? Acceleration. Acceleration. Yes. But why? Why does that need to improve? Yeah, let's let's look speed. Let the time speed. I'm, I'm getting a lot of bullshit here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Detail. Coaching detail. He was upright the whole time. He never like started in a crouch and then accelerated up through his, through his run. We can't see that from that angle, but that is quite okay. But there's a gross error there that we need to see with our coach and I. Wheelbarrow arms. Yes. Side to side. Energy leaks. You're right about the getting upright more and more of an angle and gradually coming upright, but his, his energy leaks side to side. He needs to fix that. We have the technology to fix it, but we need to coach an eye to fix it. And here is the player where it matters on the pitch. There in the corner, he's running. It's much more symmetrical. It's much more in line performance. That's what it's all about. Applied coaching with good knowledge, integrating the technology. And I think this is course can, can give that information. Did I swear there? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so you know, I messed up. <laughs> um, <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it is on top of that. Don't worry, it's not like it's pre-90 oh, yeah. BBC or anything. Um, but uh, no, Des, thank you very much for uh, startup as well as joining the panel along with Andrew and Eamon, uh, and for all the other startups that uh, spoke this evening. Um, we are here until 9 p.m., so another 45 minutes. Please help us eat pizza and drink the drink. It's a tough mission, but we need someone to help us there. Um, in, in New York, when we started Digital Irish six years ago, we went on a, a wild ride that um, in the last year and a half, we had events on uh, fashion tech with the heads of design of DKNY shoes. We had Mark Little speak on his journey in Storyful. We had C-Suite from Google talking about the experiments they're doing in Google X, uh, and a host of other events. Uh, we're looking to emulate and, re and replicate that here in London. So um, we be in tonight. We had one event last year. We're looking to really pick off with some momentum this year. Um, so thank you very much for joining us in the first step tonight. We're um, not going to be doing one event a month as they are in New York just yet, but we'll hopefully ramp up to that. Um, but um, yeah, uh, follow us on Eventbrite. Also, Libs IIBN, um, similar organisations on a similar journey trying to promote Irish business I as we are Irish innovation or, or Irish connection innovation. Uh, follow them as well. They, they, they gave us a shout out for tonight as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully see you all at other events uh, in the future. Thanks so much for coming tonight. And uh, we're here till nine, eat, drink, all that, and then if forever's around, still pop across the road. Uh, thanks so much for coming. See you.